Well, everybody, welcome back to session three of Mike and Darren Unplugged with uh, Dr. Peter Field. And we continue to talk about the plight of the humanities. In our first conversation, we tried to describe what we think the humanities are and why they're important. Uh, then we talked about some of the challenges they face and the problems they have. Um, and now I thought it would probably be a good idea to talk about Quo Vadis, where from here, where are we headed? Uh, what hope is there? Um, what are the prospects? So uh, with that, I, I turn to my, um, my, my, my uh, wise and sagacious interlocutors. Anyone want to jump in? Well, I thought at least I'd say one word. Um, say so. Again, a little bit, a little bit flippant, but I, I was reading some of this, and mm. it seems to me here, in there's a madman, so we don't know that this is Nietzsche, but the madman, and so you know where I'm going. And there's yeah. an interesting quote, which does seem to speak to us. It says, humanities is dead. Humanities remains dead. And we have killed him. <laughs> okay. So, and uh, by the way, but of course, I think I'll, I'll let Mike kick off, but I do want to suggest or will suggest that we actually can find in some ways God and humanities in interchangeable in some ways. And what Nietzsche was gesturing at there, we might actually take, especially for those who might not be of a, a theological or a, a salvific um, bent, um, a parallel. Okay. That's a, a strange uh, arrangement of things. Uh, it seems to me that these formulations are not different from religion. They're just different religious sects. So uh, uh, it's hard to see how the critics can be answered because the uh, the charges that are being made are that the humanities and the West is sinful. And of course it is. But um, that's not by any means unique to the West. This is, in fact, the human condition where one species under a different set of constraints. This restraint can be geographical or environmental. It can be uh, 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 biological in the sense of that, yeah. you know, you may or may, ha may not have antibodies to given epidemics. Um, so to split the world um, into, uh, into subsets, I think, is a mistake generally. When we're looking at the history of the world, we have to remain conscious that we are just one thing that spread very rapidly, very successfully across the planet. Mm. Well, okay, it's, it's a lot on the table here. I don't know uh, entirely how to move this forward. So, just one thing is: is the is the weakness of the humanities or the the as what Mike calls the critics of the humanities, are they primarily criticizing the West or humanities in general? Um, which is to say there's bell letters and music and philosophy um, elsewhere in the world. Um, and and maybe it's it's both or maybe it's it's different groups. but um, were I to see someone to say, look, I would I would just like to, you know, keep the Shakespeare. I have no problem with that. I would just like to throw in, if I might, the tale of Genji. Um, that's different from saying, well, you know, let, let's jettison it all. And maybe we're dealing with both. Maybe we're dealing with one or the other. I don't know. I'm just throwing that out there. Yeah, one's a, one's a sneeze. The other one is an epidemic that threatens to knock the whole thing down. But well, which, 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 is, which is it that you see? is right now um, the problem? Just the, let's not be so Eurocentric or let's just burn humanities down, the whole thing is? Oh, I, I think we're very close to burning it down. I, I think it's close to being okay. humanities being dead and what's killed it. Um, I, I, surely I'll pull back from that. Um, Good. Because <laughs> it's very it's depressing. Like, it's, yeah, it'd be very depressing. Um, but I do think the onslaught is systemic, maybe. We'll try that one, Darren. It's not um, just worrying about maybe one digit 
um, or problem. I, I think we're worried about systemic failure here. So, um, and we only do the West, right, Michael, because it's convenient. I mean, there is some sort of hole um, oh, I, on the whole Borges is, is not answering to, you know, all fall apart or, or the tale of Genji. That's all. Um, but yeah, humanities is humanities. I, I have to dissent a little bit. I mean, I agree with you. You need to see the whole and global culture and yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, only, I mean, this may be our problem uh, on the Western front, only in the West and in a Western university would somebody say, well, you know, we really, you know, it's just arbitrary that we focus on the West. I, I assure you, if you go to a Turkish university and then study history there, there'll be more than a little bit of Turkish history. <laughs> And kids go to, you know, a Chinese um, university, they'll teach you more than a bit of Chinese history and Chinese culture, and certainly Communist Party Chinese history and culture. Um, I don't know about that. I mean, you know, we study the West in part because we live here. And it's our home. But that's not the only reason. No, uh, I agree. In, in the last 500 years, um, the West has been the most important transformative force at a global level and the achievements of the West uh, during those 500 years have uh, superseded previous achievements by the human species. It's yep. not all Western. Prior to about 1500, most of the real big, real big achievements are going on in China. Before yep. that, you have Greco-Roman Mediterranean culture. And before that, you get a bunch of uh, river valley civilizations, Egypt to, to uh, the Tigris Euphrates, to the Indus. Mm -hmm. And recently, I found out about an Oxus River civilization contemporary with the Indus yeah. with which they traded. OK, so we got <laughs> we're lucky enough here to get four different separate hearths of culture. So no wonder they were far outrunning the rest of the world. They had certain advantages nobody else had. Um, a thing that we're thinking about is... I, I, uh, by the way, I don't disagree with any of that, Mike. I mean, I'm, not, okay. I'm not saying we just study um, the West because we live here. But I am saying everybody studies where they live. Because you live there. That's right. But the, my question for you guys then is, is the challenge that we find facing humanities, um, even if it's disguised as a challenge to the colonization or to the West or to the last 500 years. At, at heart, the challenge, nevertheless, I think is much more deep than that. And it is a kind of misanthropy or, or problem with the human. It's just under well, one problem, guise. Problem with the historically successful and the historically uh, uh, dominant human for the last couple of five, for the last few centuries. In other words, uh, Alan Bloom, or rather Harold Bloom talked about the school of resentment. Yeah. A great deal of the politics has drifted into the soft sciences has been driven by resentment. And it's a strange combination because this resentment of the West, which incidentally is the source not only of the ideas you're criticizing, but also the concepts you're using with which to criticize them. So if you think you're going to get out of the West just by telling us how bad it was, you are hopelessly mired in it. You are. You, have, you only have one of two choices. You're either going to be conscious of the intellectual influences which are operating all around you, or you're going to be unconscious of them. So the only real freedom you're going to get is by being conscious of the intellectual milieu, which is Western, that dominates the current world. For God's sake, we're on the internet. Right. Okay, so I, think, no, I, th I think that's fair. I think that's the same kind of point. I, I don't think Peter would dissent. So let me Not raise the next level question. Um, how do we account for this, that the presumably most sensitive and thoughtful souls of, and not just our age, I mean, I don't know when we want to say this problem began of a sort of um, self, self uh, reproach, self loathing of, and it's, it's not just of the West. What's fascinating is you could easily, I, I think you might have easily at one point had um, humanistic scholars saying, the West has not lived up to our uh, higher ideals exemplified in our scholarship, in our in the literatures we study. 
That's not what they're saying. They're saying, oh, that's a bag of crap. And what I got at my PhD in was a waste of time. Mm -hmm. Right? That's kind of special. How do we account for that? Mm -hmm. Or can we? I mean, maybe, maybe it's just, you know, too many, too many variables involved and too many cases, as it were. Well, I think there's a lot to try to account for, to be sure. Um, but from, from my perspective, there are no bad dogs or bad children. Right? There are only bad owners and bad parents. So I think probably we have to take some pretty big responsibility here mm -hmm. um, and say oh. that one way or another, whatever seems to be very much infecting us is our doing. And in fact, that's one of the interesting things now that we're all old enough to think generationally or multi-generationally. Um, it's shocking to look back at what we thought would be a joke or a sideline and and find it owning the place. If nothing yeah. else, we've abdicated in some way or failed. Um, it's I, not over. No, no. I, I look, I, I do appreciate you correcting me. Your, your focus is right. I don't mean uh, to... Um, uh, my, my trouble is not with with students and young people who are filled with idealistic delusions. That's natural. I was. I mean, everybody in their adolescence is. I, I agree with, with Peter, but but that was my question. And not not had the kids get so crazy, and we get so crazy. Kids, you know, they're always going to be a little crazy. That's part of the fun of teaching them. Is you know, they're they're trying to figure out the world, how they relate to it. Um, how, what their sense of identity is vis-a-vis -vis the world. And as the world smacks them upside the head with a two by four, they revise. Well, I, I would, I, my it's answer, adults, I'm curious about. again, a baby answer would be um, not what we expect. It's not because life has gotten more difficult, but somehow it relates to the fact that it seems to have gotten easier. Um, in fact, it seems like we can control so much that I feel that especially among the, uh, intelligentsia they have the notion that we can control everything and they're wrong mm -hmm. so you lose a sense of um in humanities of the value of humanity if you feel that humans are eternal um again if, if no one <laughs> it, it, the great thing about achilles and iliad right is the agonist he, he grows up and he only grows up <clears throat> when you realize he's not immortal but mortal so i think we have uh a sickness of immortality right you can be whatever you want there is no nature we're completely in control of nature and it's like um you know playing tennis with the net down if there are no rules frankly then there's no sense of the tragic there's no sense of the limitations of the human and without a sense of limitations i think actually um funny enough people become miserable um they only... The consequence of abolishing cultural taboos is not liber liberty, but anomie. That's Durkheim. Yeah. yeah. So, Darren, <laughs> does, is, that, is that a good start, though? Um, it is. It's anomie or something like that. We have terrible affluence. We have remarkable control over the world. Never have had more control of the world. And yet that doesn't seem to have made people very happy. Well, okay, maybe maybe let's. I'm not t entirely satisfied. I'm not. I'm not saying that that that's not you know doesn't help. But maybe another way to tackle this is when did, um, or was there a moment first when the high culture was useful and healthy, um, and and if if so, when and where has it gone off the rails, and is are any of those episodes instructive for our, our current problems because at some point apartments came back so you know i'm i'm looking for reads for for, for, for straws of hope so when um oh let's not do that Let, let's get more pessimistic for a while first well let, let me let me let me give you a, a, a kind of narrative so you know um mike mentioned that last 500 years the west has been dynamic and by that we mean it's going to move over time but it's mostly the north atlantic literal we're talking about um which is a very small part of europe um and yeah 
uh, we could start to figure out some of the reasons why that may or may not have to do with um, the emergence of the humanities. But one thing that happened is parts of Europe got wealthy enough that they could take money and spend it on giving people like you guys patronage so you can do your scholarship and have the leisure to do it. And to obviously you're being paid to also glorify your patrons, which which you did. Um, at some point in, I'd say, the early 16th century, that was sustainable among a tiny, tiny, tiny fragment of society. Um, at some point in the 16th century, when the printing press met up with Martin Luther, um, the European polity changed and went through a fundamental crisis. And the people who had studied humanities weren't always, like Erasmus, humanistic. Some of them became religious uh, dogmatists and, fan and, and, and fanatics. There were dissenting voices. Cervantes is one. Montaigne is one. Plenty of them. But there, nonetheless, um, Europe went kind of crazy, I think it would be safe to say, for, um, what should we say, century and a half? Almost two centuries? Okay. And then it pulled out of it. So that craziness, no doubt, was a result of mass liter literacy, which changed the nature of religion from orthopraxy to orthodoxy, and therefore introduced creedal struggle. Um, okay. Are you so taking what? notes here, Mike? Are you taking notes? Well, I mean, I'm not completely convinced <laughs> of that either, you know. I mean, but go ahead. Uh, you know, I, I think of the Cathars and the tradition of I'm not saying I'm not saying, I'm not saying there weren't heresies before that. The Albigensian heresy is obviously one. Um right. I am saying is very few of them reached broadly across borders and deep into the social structure. Yeah. Even the Cathars were in a largely aristocratic development. Right. It's okay. true. You you're getting the beginnings of it with guys like Wycliffe and John Huss. I absolutely agree with you. And even Savonarola. Um, but they can't they can't blow the world up yet because you don't have mass print. Until you have mass print, there is no point for anyone to learn to read that doesn't do it for a living. It's so much work, and it's like a year's wages to get your hands on a document. So I'm there's awesome. just no point learning. So it's a dead-end technology. That changes when you get the penny press. Anyway, mm -hmm. so... Um, so people get ideological. Well, okay. well, yeah, they, they get fanatical. Uh, and that literally what Mike was saying last time, that enthusiasm, that feeling of being inspired by the divine and therefore authorized to do anything, right? I mean, ends more than justify the means. Um, okay, and do they, get, so, they get this under control then? You're saying after 150 years, after you start reading enough and you read every day, then... This becomes more controlled. No, I, 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 so, I, so two points I would make. One, to go back to your earlier point about affluenza, maybe part of the reason Europe is going so crazy is because it's actually becoming those, those areas that are having these reformations are exactly the areas that are having the commercial revolution. So they're becoming very powerful, and maybe in a very broad sense, the city is like the man and. That power drives people crazy. So what what restrains that? Um, at the other end, ultimately, I mean, there are attempts to restrain it. I think it's the Enlightenment and um, the British unification of an alliance against the expansion of France. And the two things I think are kind of related, which is that there will not be one reigning political or doctrinal view in Europe that there will be political and doctrinal and their pluralism, and therefore there will have to be some sort of toleration. Um, and I think that's, you know, uh, how did how did they make that argument? And I think this, this is maybe what, um, you know, is the grounds for revival. And that is with a mitigated skepticism. That the problem with their, with the, doctrinal beliefs of the 17th century is that they may be true, but you don't know it. And if you don't know that the right answer 
is um, Jesuit, then maybe you shouldn't torture the Jansenists. Whereas on the other hand, if you do know the right answer is Jesuit, you really should torture the Jansenists because you need to save their souls. And the torture is nothing compared to what they're going to experience in the hereafter. No, you're doing it out of the law. No, absolutely. In, in every case. Um, and I think at some point, maybe the last quarter of the 18th century, at least in the continent, that posture was felt by humanists, by the educated, to be inadequate. And they gave up the quest for a certain sort of modest objectivity for a Rousseauian subjectivity or sincerity or authenticity. And that may have been, you know, the first critical moment. You know, we've recovered it since, but um, now I would also say that moment of the French Revolution where you're getting that crazy in exactly the same part of Europe is happening at the same time that Europe's taking its next quantum leap, right? Britain in the 1740s is already into the Industrial Revolution. It's starting to move to France. And that's going to give them power to conquer the seas with great ease, right? I mean, a, a series of bribes and you've, and you've dropped India into your pocket. Um, so, you know, that probably distorted European politics, but maybe it distorted uh, the European intellectual class too, having that much power or sitting atop that much power. Just a thought, because it really goes, you know, BS crazy. Um, I would argue in the last quarter of the 19th century. Mm -hmm. Right, and that's when, you know, there's still, uh, just as there is now, there's lots of good humanistic research going on now. Don't kid yourself, there is. But you're seeing really popular things where Nietzsche is the least crazy of it. Right? This is the age of Madame Blutovsky. Well, this is the age of the Great War. Uh, it's the age leading up to the Great War. That's but then right. we only have a short break between the wars. So are you saying that this we're, it's not our generation, it's our century, what I'm saying our century is, and a half that hasn't stopped, or um, is this? I'm saying it, 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 it's it's it keeps coming in waves and then gets kind of pushed back a little bit, but it's never, you know, never resolved. The next wave comes. Look, the U.S. in some ways is going through this worse than the rest of the Western world right now. This sort of, as you say, anti-Western stuff, because it didn't have it as much as the rest of Europe, of Western Europe, you know, 60, 70, 80, even, you know, 90 years ago. They had it really bad then. And they got it out of their system by filling a lot of mass graves, which is kind of, by the way, how you got out of the religious wars. You filled a lot of mass graves and then said, holy, you so know. You're, you're looking holy. for another war. <laughs> we, we need another war so that we'll wake up and step back and say, oh, look at the drugs that the intellectuals are feeding us. Let's get them out of our veins. We've had enough bloodletting. I'm not I'm not looking for it. I'm saying no. that it has it has led there um, or at least been associated with it or a part of it. Um, and in some ways, I mean, they've got plenty of problems in Europe, too. I'm not trying to claim that we're the worst and they're the best or vice versa, but they don't seem to have this problem, except for in England. Britain's having it. But the rest of Europe doesn't seem to be having this problem in their universities, like we are. I mean, they have problems, but not like we are. No, Grin, Eastern Europe, the former Soviet Union, no, don't seem to be suffering. Neither, so neither in Italy or in France either, or Spain. Well, why should the Czech Republic feel sorry for colonialism? I mean... What are they going to do? Take down the statue of Masaryk just so they can join the crowd? I mean, he didn't have anything to do with it. They didn't have anything to do with it. But even if they did, um, the attempt to abolish the past um, is futile. And tearing down the remnants of the past um, will not change the future. What will change the future is facing up to the facts of the past. And then 
recognizing that we can do better, provided we're we we tame our arrogance and try and improve the world gradually in a piecemeal way in an ongoing fashion imperfectly rather than abolishing the past and starting again from year zero as they did in the uh, uh, among the Jacobins and also among the Camer Rouge. Oh, did they do that? They started a new yeah, calendar? They did. Yeah, they did. Oh I, I could really use a new calendar about now, actually. By the way, you know, instead of every year, how about every day we start over? I'm all for Well, it. no, what I'd prefer to do is abolish uh, the movement from uh, standard time to daylight savings time. And instead of doing it every year, do it once every 24 years. <laughs> <laughs> it's a six to okay. All right. All right. Um, just change the date. But, but so let, let me ask you about humor. Is there somehow in late 19th century um the end of humor? We seem to have lost our ability to laugh and laugh at ourselves. Um and that's oh, it's Oscar Wilde. Yeah, exactly. So it, there, there, so there is still there. Yeah. Um so, so that, the, the, that's 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 you're right. I mean it's, it's wonderfully funny, but it is it's uh it's cutting wit. It's not broad, traditional, broad English humor. Well, I, my point is that what Mike says that we need to do about learning and trying to learn from the past is what we're trying to do is not take ourselves so seriously, right? And the reason we have humanities, it seems to be the one of the few ways that we actually can learn about ourselves. But well, it's, look, it's too difficult to learn. If, it, if it, people turn away because they find it too difficult, then they're not taking their medicine. And but, you're but not he, taking he, your medicine you're going to hide from this for him sorry Darren. okay see this is this is where it all gets weird for me we're talking about guys who study discrete parts of in, in our case western history maybe western literature maybe maybe western music um maybe western philosophy um they do this neither Perhaps they do it to celebrate. Perhaps they do it to criticize. But presumably they do it because they're fascinated by it and want to understand it. Otherwise, they really picked a bad job, a really bad career. So um, we're talking about how, well, you know, you can reject that scholarly tradition because, you know, you have to overcome histories of oppression. I'm not sure. Did Miranda D. Piccola or Giordano Bruno colonize anyone? That's what we're talking about, right? Right. So, um, or is it because as a humanist scholar, it's your responsibility to heal the world? Really? I didn't see that in your contract. You're not doing a very good job of it. If it's in the contract that you haven't seen, they're not you doing know, a very good job. I, I'm I'm coming back to the very first definition of justice in book two of the Republic, where he builds the, the, the cities, city of sows. And he says, the city of sows will take care of itself. Justice will take care of itself. If everyone does their own job, your job is not to redress historical grievances. Your job is to study the past. Your job is to study the history of music, maybe produce music, maybe film. Will the question of pain and suffering and colonization in the past sometimes be relevant? Of course it will. But that's not your job. Sometimes it will be relevant to your job, but it's not your job. Do your job. The To me, I'm going to keep coming back to this question. Why do people who signed up for a job not only not want to do the job, but abolish the job? Right? It's like Daniel L. Padilla L., the uh, classics professor at Princeton, who uh, is uh, uh, deeply concerned with identity politics, and he wants to not just alter but abolish classics because it is uh, a vehicle of white supremacy. Uh, now, I always thought stuff, I mean, I, I don't know. Uh, Wow. Are the Egyptian are the Egyptians of Mesopotamians white? I'm not sure. I mean, Saint Augustine was a Berber. Is he white? I'm not sure. But Daniel has decided that uh, these are all white, and they justify oppression and stuff like that. 
And uh, hold, uh, now, hold on, hold on a second. Okay. I, 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 the, you could fill, you know, uh, mansions with what I don't know. But I could have sworn that the only eggheads you're going to find talking about specifically white supremacy date after about 1850. They're guys like Houston Chamberlain, um, Arthur, um, what's his name? The friend, Go, Gobino, Gobino in the United States, Josiah Nam. Thank you. Um, I wasn't aware that that was something that was really big in Petrarch. Nor was I aware. Now, I know um, Hume made some nasty comments, as did Lord, uh, Lord Mombato. Um, but I don't think that's true of Diderot and about 90% of the others. Not that they had nice things to say. They didn't have anything to say. Just, no, they were, only it never occurred to them that that was their bailiwick, that they had that kind of power and control over anything. So again, this is where it seems to me we saw back in the 1980s and 90s um, higher education losing its way. Um, because what we found was what folks were, it was almost counterintuitive, studying more and more and more focused, more and more details. Darren, you mentioned this earlier, and virtually none of them, even at Columbia, where the great books course was still the core, um, mm -hmm. how few of them were willing to try to learn everything. And I don't mean to overstate that because of course our ignorance can fill, as Darren says, many, many mansions. Uh, we know next to nothing and we know we know next to nothing. But still to have the scope and the ambition to try to master everything is something that seems to be entirely lost. And my view is, alas, for teachers, you actually can't do anything specific without knowing kind of something about everything. And these folks simply have gotten tired and lazy. They haven't, they don't have the grasp and the desire, like a lot of our teachers did, to try to know a lot. And so what do they do if they don't know much of anything? You end up not being a teacher. Because of course, teaching is a joke. There's a paradox because all prep, all protriptic is paradoxical in this way, right? There, there's no Peter's teaching. There's no doxa, right? There's no promised land. We don't do that. So it's much easier to engage in ideology and tell people the right way to do things and the right side of things as opposed to exploring it, right? So um, might as well, it's much easier to say, hey, here's the promised land for you. Let me spell it out for you, as opposed to engaging in paradox. I kind of like to think of the soup Nazi and Seinfeld. No, no promised land for you, right? A real teacher <laughs> doesn't offer doxa. And it seems to me we can date that back from remembering graduate school and how people were minted with PhDs who really didn't know very much and didn't want to know about everything, about the River Valley civilization. It's about the origins of language, about music, about art, about literature, about philosophy. Uh, you, you guys don't probably remember, Michael, I don't know that you remember this, but I remember you coming to me and proposing getting a PhD in philosophy or political philosophy at Princeton at the same time that you were doing a history PhD at Columbia. So that, that might have been a bit of overreach, but I get the idea. No, I just wanted to read a different set of books at the same time. And I thought while I was reading them, well, why shouldn't somebody give me a degree for it? <laughs> Eventually, I just kept on reading and then decided that I didn't care whether anybody gave me a degree for anything. <laughs> and that's when Columbia told me that I really do have to uh, move along. Right, because so, the best piece of advice, Darren, quickly, that, that I remember Michael giving us, or certainly to me, was um, you just don't read for a syllabus. You read everything. Right? Yeah. It's all out there. That's the project. You'll never get there. But nevertheless, I don't see anyone with that kind of ambition. And if you don't have that ambition, then what do you fall back on as a teacher? It's a useful mental illness. <laughs> well, so if I can offer the 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 the, the uh, shards of hope now, um, mm -hmm. it is first that humanistic works of humanistic value have not always been either created or studied in an academic yeah. setting. Um, there have been long, dry spells. So a curious thing, and, you know, I'm always singing the praises of my 18th century enlightenment, but universities 
didn't teach literature. They taught classics, right? But this is the age of Dryden, Addison, fact, Shakespeare, Milton. None of that can get any university. But people still read it and studied it. And it wound up having a lot more influence over the long time, over the long term than, say, the Georgics. Um, so it, it, it doesn't necessarily have to be in any university. I don't know what the other sites could be. I mean, Peter is right. Part of these problems of the ideological infiltration and polarization of the university started really in the late 60s and early 70s. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but you did immediately see that mm. as, as particularly in political science and in policy schools, when it became like illegal to be <laughs> right of a certain perspective, um, there emerged all of these alternative crypto universities called think tanks, yeah. right? AI, Cato, and, and Heritage and whatever, um, mm. where they continue to do that, the, the social scientific research, the policy research. Um, maybe that's the future. Maybe it's an alternative universities. Um, maybe it's 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 the market. People just writing literature, writing criticism, doing YouTube videos, which you're doing. Yeah, I was just going to come to that. Maybe it comes out to something like this as the universe, as the internet gets more complicated, more immersive, and you can do more things with it. Uh, if you could imagine something, I don't know, that would do it to our videos what hypertext does to a page so that, you know, if you just touch something on the right, on the side here, you would go over to what word is, what is the, is one of the professors mangling or uh, <laughs> things like, uh, yes. uh, all right. I, I got, I got right nailed in the person. comment, screwing up to uh, uh, Genghis Khan's name and my bad. Well, I, I once lectured on the Old Testament and lost the wrong tribes of Israel. It can be very difficult. Just one slip of the tongue. You lost them all. Not, not just the yeah. one. You lost them all. Where, where, the, where the heck did Reuben go when I was yeah. Well, look, I, I, know, I know what we, are. Are. I know what we can do with the universities, though. What we can do with the universities is keep the majority here because the majority actually are administrators. <laughs> we have one <laughs> administrator for this channel, which is your right. daughter, um, because there are more administrators than there are. Um, professors yeah. and lecturers and by the way they're the highest paid people on campus so of well course. in fact one of the comments i read on the last um uh, uh podcast we did which i i thought was very very thoughtful was um you know and i, I didn't mean to give the implication they were sort of responding to well why aren't kids studying the humanities and he said well maybe because no one wants to go in like two hundred thousand dollars in debt um you know, without any prospect of employment. And and, and absolutely, I, w I wasn't talking about the kids. I was talking about the, the grown-ups. Right? The kids, as far, Peter is right. Kids are innocent. Kids are just kids. Kids are always the same. It's the adults around them who, who enable their good behavior or their bad behavior. Because we were all kids, and we'd have gotten away with anything you let us get away with. I mean, I was yeah, really fortunate. Right? My, my, my superiors didn't allow me to and, and molded me a little bit. Um, we have some prodigious cases of arrested development on campus. People that are old enough to know better yeah. are constantly trying to validate the, the proposition that they really haven't aged and they don't sound like Marine, uh, like Marin County hippies in a hot tub, right? So instead they get all strident and scream and roar. And uh, I just become kind of tired of it because of the endless self-righteousness of it. You see, uh, this new movement in the left, this what we'll call the new, new postmodern left, uh, left um, left wingers like me and like you and like Pete, I think, uh, back in the world of rationality with real external worlds and all that kind of thing. The new stuff yeah. is just all talk. But it's interesting talk uh, because it's about itself. And uh, after a while, I mean, it just seems to me that the vacuity of this and the lack of any re of any serious permanent intellectual achievement means that this is going to become a, a, a period piece 100 years from now. So if we continue to defend the canon, it doesn't mean we aren't open to modifications because you have to do that. 
Yeah. Uh, so that's when you when somebody says, "Look, let's read this book." A little time. That's worth talking about. But the idea of abolishing this because it's hegemonic—that's intellectual vandalism. We all watched it happen, and uh, now the vandals uh, are in charge, or the second generation of them, and they don't know what they've lost. They don't know what got destroyed or what they're missing. I, th I think that's if, yeah. if we're going to save the campus and we probably aren't so i think we darren's probably right we're just going to find alternate sites but if we were to save mm -hmm. campus life um and then restore mm -hmm. some campus credit or something like that um mm -hmm. some things got to change uh we got to get some humor back on campus we got to do away with earnestness we got to get some sense of the tragic back we got to get yeah. agonistes back we have to have some sort of agon um michael <laughs> couldn't, couldn't be more right about that no <laughs> um we have to restore nature and think about humans between, say, animals and nature or something like that. We need gratitude back. Um, yeah. and, and we also need a sense of the promised land. We need a sense that we're not in it already um, so that we can find how far we fall short. Moses was denied entrance to the promised land. What have our current crop of critics <laughs> done to deserve admission? Well, they feel they have. They, they feel they have. Well, I know. That's my point. What makes you think that you're entitled to this? Right? Uh, mm -hmm. That's one of the things I have. Uh, there's, a, there's a sense of frustrated entitlement in this new postmodern uh, identity politics left. And, uh, for example, I was just reading, and it was uh, a book that was urged upon me by pe people that are smart enough to know better it's called the dawn of everything well i actually put my time in and read this thing and uh yeah well um the difficulty is is that uh the stance that you see in books like this starts out with the presumption of guilt right there's something wrong with us and now the opponents yeah, I know, are going to be given the chance to defend themselves only insofar as those who have decided their guilt in advance are willing to put that data in. Uh, so uh, my sense is that the humanities are in pretty bad shape because we've lost touch with reality. We are under the spell of some sort of chimerical perfection. And the Augustinian sense of human limitation and depravity has been repra replaced by a kind of Rousseauian, I'm so great attitude. Now, I, I would say that this probably this certainly began in the 60s, but I think the real dangerous shift, late 80s, early 90s, when you got when we were all in graduate school, and you could mm -hmm. see it in language. This is the, the time when the sinister and diabolical term workshop enters our language as a verb many of us are forced to attend workshops and no one has yet been able to tell you what a workshop is except a stupid mandatory meeting that you should have sent me an email about all right and we're all going to get to hands together and we're all going to try and improve ourselves in the world so um the fact that i've been to too many workshops is a problem and it's a problem both in history but also in language the second word that worries me when I made a transition was the time when parent became a verb. We're going to do parenting. So did workshop, by the way. Yeah, okay. Oh, to go to a parenting workshop, bang my head on the desk, right? No, I mean, you can't imagine what that would be like. I don't know. I think some parents could, could workshop some things out pretty well. Well, no doubt there are plenty of bad parents. I'm not sure the solution is workshops well look I, 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 but again the, the, the problem may have its roots there but it's remarkable how it's spread everywhere so we've just gone through this pandemonium and it seems to me the heart of the pandemic was the sense that well no one's allowed to get sick right so yeah. we're still in this promised land where people aren't allowed to suffer we can't let a bank fail we can't let anything fail um really people do die so my my solution so darren i have one solution it's it's a little bit flippant, but I think that every student should spend some portion of their time on a farm and realize, sorry, in order for things to live, other things die. 
It seems mm -hmm. we've lost that. So uh, my sense, again, is you, you go into the supermarket and the only place you, you see anything is, is under cellophane and you don't have any sense then that there's tragic, that there's a cycle and things die. And that's where you lose that sense um, um, of, funny enough, as we were saying, the great value in human life because you don't have to redeem it, right? So the reason you have to find meaning, and I do in humanities, I'm sure others find it in, in salvific ways, but I find it in humanities, is because you have to find compensation for suffering. And if we reject suffering and we can't see it and the world can't talk about it, right? We're not allowed to, we have to workshop it, we have to parent it, but we're not allowed to actually talk about it, then we don't know ourselves. And if we don't know ourselves at all, then we're in big We have to find a, a discreet political group we can blame our suffering on. In other words, rather than it being part of the human condition, we have to find somebody that's behind it all. That's right. It's because if it's not easier. part of the human condition, then if someone that's must right. be exactly at fault and that perfectly fits into you our notion of religious. Is. Yep, you do. Yeah, that's exactly right. Um, I, I, I like the idea that uh, um, the humanities may be able to pull themselves out using, as Darren suggested, alternative institutions. I've heard of some place in, uh, in I think, Austin, Texas, where they're trying to put together some new university now. Yeah. That's a uh, very hard University thing. of Texas at Austin, yeah. That's there right. we go, yeah. Well, I mean, that's a very hard thing to do. Uh, yeah. In the short term, to do what we can to uh, make worthwhile reading accessible to the educated public is I be, think the best we can do right now. I mean, I'm trying to upload as much of what I know, which is a, a, a hit and miss thing. Uh, <laughs> well, you do, you do what you can. That's all you can yeah, do. Yeah, right. That's exactly it. You're paying the coin of your realm. All right. Uh, so even if we just uh, slow the erosion of the humanities and ask uh, unpopular questions like uh, how is it that that uh, the past has become so um, synonymous with moral evil isn't that a way of promoting yourself to a morally superior generation that is entitled to judge the rest of our species I mean the amount of arrogance right. that this takes it makes candide look like diogenes yes it does yeah i think thomas soul had a book on that topic called the the vision of the anointed uh -huh. well i mean it's, you know it's that's well what worth it, reading he, he well, really like he's off that's he's, what, that's what he's our whole life had we right. so all well, got humanity humanity's humanity is, is in my view the at least in my perspective the, the best antidote we have because it strikes and looks for something that's human. And when it's universal, then you look to the individual and find in it everything. So the great mm -hmm. vast ab abyss of, of horror is in every heart, just like love is in every heart. And so again, humanity seems to me to be that rescue. And if you can't find it in Raskolnikov, if you can't find it in Othello, if you can't find it in Hamlet, um, or in Ham, <laughs> even our, our little Hamlet from Endgame. Um, it, it's a real pity um, because you're going to try to find it somewhere outside of you. And we all know that it, the truly sensitive souls will know they're lying about that because they'll want to oh, hide. Can... They'll hide from everyone, but they know the the darkness in their own heart. So what we need are uncles think... and teachers and aunts who remind everyone, yes, that disgusting thing is you. And you know what? You've got to learn to live with it. Open up about it. Talk about it. And the humanity gives you the individual level. Right. It's true at the individual level, but it's also true at the social level. Face what you are historically and as part of a group of people, but don't get the misapprehension that there's something particularly evil about you. We're a thievish, avaricious, murderous species, and uh, there's nobody here and no group of people that has clean hands. So once we get to the point where we realize 
what we are. And I think that the and Augustine has it right about human nature. Maybe he goes, or he, he does go a little far, but the idea that human nature is not perfectible is actually really smart because it's the source of the idea of limited government. Now, right. Under the, uh, yeah. As, yeah. Right. Yeah. I mean, that's why you can't give one, too one much of the sources. Power. Certainly. So yeah. look, if you don't have that idea of the Augustinian frailty of human nature, um, that is a ticket to unlimited government. Right. It's a very dangerous assumption. So yeah. I find it a one, wonderful and ironic thing that the very people I know and care for so much who have such a hunger and desire for to consume it all are the same ones who say, "What well, that what we see is is the Augustinian, <laughs> right? Is is how crooked the timber is that we are, and yet we never tire of it in humanities of getting to know it better and better. Right? Well, so there's, actually... there's a fearlessness, right, Michael, of looking inside and accepting what's there, and it's just a lie to say, well, if I don't look, it's not there. Um, expose yourself. Like W.H. Auden said, you shall love your crooked neighbor with your crooked heart. <laughs> well, you, be you, better, you better accept your crooked neighbor's crooked heart or you'll never love them. Because either That's you love right. them as crooked or you don't love. Mm -hmm. And who are we crooked as we are to straighten them out? Let <laughs> me stop and think about it. But we're not. The whole point is you. this is what's different here is you're, there is no Segruvian dogma or doxa. No one's ever going to find that. Hell, you haven't found it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, I know don't know what you do. do but right? I, actually, no. I do know one thing. I was writing this down the other day. <laughs> right? I know Socratic. The yeah. No, it's totally Socratic. Uh, the Euthyphrosian aporetic dialogue uh, that means it comes to an impasse and they don't really get an answer. That's because uh, Euthyphro is using the uh, religious law to uh, legally murder his father. Uh, he says it's because he's really devoured and the gods want it and all stuff like that. But it's really because he wants to get daddy out of the way and get the inheritance early. So uh, Socrates is talking to him about piety and you know what God likes and whether God likes things that are good because they're good or whether they're good because God likes them, which uh, is actually a, an interesting problem. I think I, know, I have a solution, but I, I don't want to talk about that now. Uh, they try to find piety, though. And uh, after thinking about it for a long time, I figured it out because I, I didn't understand it when I did those lectures back in, what was it, 94? Uh, you know, the ones on Plato. Right. But the answer is this, uh, and this will meet, meet uh, Socratic scrutiny, and uh, you can take this to the bank. And okay. that's what I asked so much. All right, here it is. Um, piety is doing honor to God by being of service to men. Being of service that's a home to run, fellas. Yeah, I think that is a home run. Um, yeah, I know. You have to have both. It turns out what you're saying is two things, and they're paradoxical and wonderful, which is you can't do service to men without some sense of God or universal, but some sense of universal always has to be what played out as we do in embodied in these embodied things in service to each other. Right. So all we have is each other, and yet we can't have each other without a sense of divine. God has no need for our help is far beyond our help or hindrance well the so, last thing god wants us to have is theology that would be my guess anyway that would god doesn't want last. anything <laughs> god doesn't want anything because he has he's infinitely plenitude uh he is the summation of all of all perfections so god doesn't want things the darren I'm, I'm, I'm willing to, I'm, i want to we probably have to wrap this up and you should have the last word so i'm going to give michael i'm going to go from the sublime to the ridiculous okay and just say that for me, the ridiculous is simply that I consider humans, I consider myself apparatic, uh, to be sure, which is there is no answer. There is there is no ultimate answer. And yet you got to live through life. And the wonderful thing is to accept it as it is anyway. Even as Nietzsche talked about metempsychosis, if you had to relive it, would you? 
And that's the great challenge to all of us. It's an extraordinarily difficult challenge, but right. And hopefully folks who find some of the humanities and some meaning out of some of your dialogues and discussions online uh, will remind themselves that it's apparatic and it's worthwhile. Mm -hmm. I've got nothing to add. <laughs> that was beautiful. <laughs> that was absolutely beautiful. Um, yeah. Um, you know, uh, we may need a fourth session just because you guys put so much on the table. That's wonderful that, you know, I took some Perhaps notes. Hmm? Well, Perhaps Michael sure. spent a lifetime reading. I, I've known no one who has a broader mm -hmm. swath of, of, of knowledge than you. And you summarize it in a sentence about pie. <laughs> so it's, it's, I, well, I think, no, that's I think the we're best gonna... thing that, that God did to me. I mean, he could have let me go with with zip for 40 years of reading, and then I would have had the kind of fashionable uh, skepticism at the, whether this is worth anything. But no, he gives me one thing, one crumb, and it turns out to be right. And so there I am walking around this thing mentally for about 20 years and uh, examining it. And uh, it's uh, a lot like the emperor of China when Nestorian Christianity got in. But that's another discussion. Uh, for now, though, uh, I'd like to talk more about the humanities when you get the chance. And uh, mm -hmm. I, uh, uh, you know, appreciate the chance to do it with you fellas. It's been a long time. Absolutely. Well, I applaud um, the both of you. And if you put in the comments where we can all get our drinking horn, um, that might be useful, too. Uh -huh. I would start with some kind of steer, but it should be a glass. I'm afraid it's the middle uh, of the day. I've got to go teach, so I'm just going to. Okay, for, for the audience, and I know there are some people out there who, who are interested, what is that opening we're looking at behind you? Ah, well, this is the game of the century, actually. Um, so this is uh, really? the end of the... Uh, I was just fooling around with this this morning. So uh, this is where uh, Kasparov is going to sacrifice a whole rook and then <laughs> sacrifice a knight. But it turns out that Topolov's king is somehow going to get trapped on the other side of the board after walking 64 squares and finally <laughs> finally gets gets uh, gets mated over here on, uh, <laughs> on across the continent. Uh, one of the great games there is, I think, from 1999 or something. By all means, have fun with it. <laughs> Kasparov Topolov. Okay, guys. Good night. Signing Ruiz. off. See you later.